Welcome to Q's Health and Wellness Podcast. This is your host, Quentin Mitchell. Today, I have a very special guest. Rick Mayo has been in the fitness industry for over 29 years and is also the CEO of Alloy Personal Training. How are you doing today? Doing good, Quinn. How are you? I'm doing good, doing good. I appreciate you coming on the show. And for people that's yeah, not thanks for having me. No problem. And for people that's not familiar with you, would you mind giving a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Well, I've been in the fitness space since 92, which I know is shocking for a young man like yourself. <laughs> it's like, how old are you? You know, it's like, I'm old. That's the answer is old. But uh, we opened uh, our first personal training center in 92. I was just a personal trainer paying my way through college and, you know, it was bouncing around. There wasn't much of an industry for personal training. I'll start with that back then. You know, it was like if you had a trainer back in the early 90s, it was like, ooh, you know, it's like having a tennis pro in the 80s. Like it was just ladies hiring young men to come over to their houses. And it it seemed creepy, but it was actually it, it is what it is now. Right. You were mm-hmm. providing a, a benefit to people for health and fitness. So but I was bouncing around at different clubs. I was going to people's homes and I thought, you know, it'd be cool if I could take this personal training service and put four walls around it, right. And create a a customer experience around it as well, like towel service and just things that would come along with a high end service like training. So we opened in 92. um, And then, yeah, we went from there. We, we doubled our space a couple years later and then it was 98. We were doing like a million bucks a year, which is a lot, you know, in 98 for personal training, that's 83 grand a month for anybody that runs a a PT Mm -hmm. studio or does personal training. That's a lot of revenue. Um, then we eventually moved from, we were all one-on-one training at that time. And then we moved our one-on-one training to more of what we call small group. It's sometimes called semi-private. So think about like four to six people with one coach. And we started putting technology and things around it so we could still claim and, and back it up with the service of personal training. But what it did is it allowed us to lower our price a little bit mm-hmm. and it allowed the business and the coaches to do better, right? To make more money and the consumer to pay less. And we could help more people in our community because it wasn't limited to just one person per hour. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a class per se, but it was more, you know, still personal training. We just figured out a way to scale it. Mm-hmm. And then because that was a great business model, we started driving like crazy high revenue at that point. Um, we ended up being one of the highest revenue per square foot facilities in the country. So that put me on the speaking circuit. So I was traveling all over the country and eventually the world, you know, speaking to fitness groups and at fitness conferences. Mm -hmm. And then one uh, one day a Gold's Gym owner came in because I was also speaking about how to sell and service coaching in a general, you know, health club market, which was different than us because we were just a studio, right? Mm -hmm. But this Gold's Gym guy came in and said, hey, I heard you speak. You know, he came by in our facility. It was Saturday morning. It was jamming. It was packed with people. Um, you know, all paying three, 400 bucks a month. And he was like, man, can you take this and put it into my gold's gym and replace my personal training department? He Mm -hmm. was like, I don't know. You know, it's kind of our market position was, as you can imagine, it's like, well, you're those guys were these guys, you know, like, don't go there, come here for your training because we're the specialist. Mm -hmm. But we thought, well, that would be a cool challenge. So we cleaned it up. You know, we, we put it into his gym. It went over really well. And then fast forward to 2019, we were in 2,300 gyms worldwide. So everywhere from Tasmania to Cyprus and India and everywhere in between, obviously a ton in the, in the U S Canada, the States, Australia, I'm having traveling all over the world, which was a lot of fun. And then in 2019, um, and, and by the way, we had powered in that process, a lot of really big franchises. So franchises like anytime fitness gold's gym, we were powering all of their coaching services. And when I say powering, it's like a white label. So they're branding it as their own, but we're the ones backing it up. So we're giving them sales systems and we're giving them digital workouts and all the things that go with it. And eventually we started then getting boutique fitness. So other studio brands that were franchised coming to us saying, Hey, can we, can you drive our, you know, power our sales system or our workouts? And at some point we were like, look, if we're going to be powering boutique fitness, that's similar to us, we should just do our own franchise because there's a much bigger upside. It's a good vehicle for the for the franchisees, right? It's like all buttoned up in this tight knit package. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also for us, it's just a better end game if we're in a franchise structure as opposed to just a li- what we call licensing structure. Mm-hmm. So yeah, man, only 30 years. And, and everybody says, did you have this planned out the whole time? You know, was this the ultimate when you opened in 92? I'm like, no, I was just hoping I could still, you know, go to work wearing sweatpants every day. <laughs> And keep that alive. (laughs) You might have to get a job in a cubicle or something. And then each time something came up, it was never planned. It was just an opportunity presented itself. Mm. And thankfully, we had the right culture to be able to take advantage of that. But yeah, it wasn't. It was never a big master plan. No, that's awesome, my man. So bringing it back when you started in '92, is this something that really inspired you, or did you see something in the fitness industry that made you want to get into it? 
I just liked it. I think like a lot of, certainly like a lot of males and, and now females as well, you know, it's like you play sports, right? And then you work out because you got to play sports. And then you also get to that age where you're like, well, I kind of like girls. So like, maybe I'll try to work out to get shapes. So I can pick up some ladies, you know, it's like, it sounds silly, but like, I think every 14, 15, 16 year old kid is going to this, that at some point in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, and then it turns out I was okay at sports, but I actually really enjoyed the training side of it, right? So for me, it was like something I started like in my garage at like 12, trying to get better at football, boxing. And then all of a sudden it was like something that uh, turns out I was okay at the actual sports, but I was really good at the training part and I really enjoyed it. So it's like, well, maybe I could teach other people how to work, work out, you know, that kind of idea. And so I think it was just, it was something I always loved. And so to be able to take a hobby and actually make a living with it, that was the all, all the inspiration that I really needed. Got you, got you. And as far as when you were personally training, did you see any like common obstacles that you see? Because for me, when I was training clients, like when I finished with college, I always it's always that thing where everybody starts off strong. Like, you know, when the new year starts, everybody starts off strong, but then they hit that obstacle. So it's like there's no motivation. So was it like a common obstacle that you've seen with your clients? I think so. I think it's the same with everybody. Everybody, you know, we know like, you know, you and I, Quinn, if we're sitting down to lunch, we're saying, OK, how long does it take to get in shape? Well, it takes a long time, you know, and most of our clients that can afford personal training, they're a little bit older, right? You know, like 40, like 35, 40 and up. And we've got some younger ones. We, everybody does the few athletes and things like that. But most of us make our living with adults that have lived long enough to save up some money. I mean, let's be honest, right? And so those folks, it's taken them 15, 20 years to get really out of shape. I mean, you know, all the stats, like you start losing muscle at 25 and your hormones get weird. And then, you know, you're, you, you just all these litany of things start happening. You start commuting, you get a family, you just put yourself last, you know, and you get really out of shape. And then when they come to us, as you know, it's like to market to them, you kind of have to market the hook that they want, which is typically like fat loss, get in shape, look great, feel good. And then when they come in, you know, it's such a long-term proposition that you really have to just create, like we found that if we just create like a really great environment, like it's a place, everybody knows they need to work out. Everybody needs to tick that box, right? It's like, it's not lost on anyone that exercise and eating well is healthy for people. Certainly, I mean, look what COVID exposed, like, you know, the obesity rates and things and what that did to making you more prone to, to get really, really sick, right? So I think we're going to see more of it. The idea is, though, you got to get them in the door and you got to like meet them where they are with this like, OK, I need to get shape for, you know, whatever this event is or something. But then once they get in there, it's just about creating a relationship, first of all, which is personal training is perfect for that mm. and making it sticky enough for them to stick around, because we all know they're not going to accomplish everything they need to in a six week challenge or a three month time period. It's mm -hmm. going to take a few years and it's going to be stacking habits, you know, like, all right, we'll start exercising first. All right. Now we're going to work on your eating habits. Now we can talk about supplementation or whatever, you know, now you need to sleep more, whatever those things are, you can't come in and just blow up your whole life and be like, all right, I'm going to, you know, you're eating McDonald's three days a week and doing all these other things. It's like, you can't change all that and start exercising and do this, 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 and that. It's like a recipe for disaster. So it's yeah. our job to kind of sell them what they want. Right. And then kind of sort of bake in what they need. And the only way to make it sticky is just to be a place that they actually enjoy. Like, I'm sure you're successful at it. Good looking guy, funny. You know, they like to come in and hang out with you. And it's like they know they need to work out. Mm -hmm. And so it goes from like, what can I accomplish in the next six weeks, which is how we get them in there to this is going to be a long term project. Right. Mm -hmm. And they get that. Ultimately, you just have to be compelling enough for them to want to keep coming in. And one of the things I like that you mentioned as well is the relationship piece, because a lot of trainers, they have. They, these get people programs, but then there's no relationship part. Like I know a lot of trainers, they do it for the money. So they'll give somebody, they'll sell them a six week program and they never follow up. They never hear from them. So a lot of these people that are just starting out in the fitness industry, they get discouraged because they're not seeing the, the results they want. But also that stems from their relationship that they're not having with their trainer. So I'm glad that you're yeah. that as well. Well, and how many times have you seen this, you know, in your experience, it's like, I, I know trainers that they look good, they're funny, they're cool, and they're terrible. They're quite honestly, technically terrible trainers, but they're always busy because it's like if you're not hurting people, like we could split hairs over like deadlift techniques and all the things that trainers like to geek out on, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter how scientific you are. If nobody wants to hang out with you or be around mm -hmm. you, it doesn't matter. And like, that's why the guy down the street that doesn't know his butthole from a kettlebell, he's <laughs> killing you right now because he's attractive, he's funny. People like to be around him. You know, he's just a really nice person. It's like, mm -hmm. what are you going to start with that? Like, you got to 
have really good people skills. And if you do, then you stack some technical habits on, you know, and some skills on top of that. But I think that's where you need to start because that's the, that's the main thing. I mean, as you know, we've te- taught all these gyms how to run personal training and we've seen over time, like we can teach people the technical part. The key is, do they have the right, you know, again, personality and things. We always say like, hire the athlete, mm-hmm. train the skill. And the athlete in this case is just what we talked about. Looks good, fun to be around you know, excited about what they do, you know, and then the technical stuff, it's like, okay, that's just science and X's and O's. We can put that together later. Mm-hmm. So a hundred percent. Yes. Sir. So another thing I'm glad that you touched on a little bit as well is the nutrition part. Cause I know a lot of people, they overlook that when they get into the, when they first start working out, um, I know a lot of people that listen to this podcast, they literally are going, cause a lot of people wait till January 1st and then they start, okay, let me start being consistent with the gym. But they don't, they overlook the nutrition and eating right. So would you mind just speaking on that a little bit and how important that is? It is. So on our corporate team here, we've got a registered licensed dietitian, right? And that, that, I mean, listen, if you're just following the American Dietetic Association guidelines, it's probably not as effective. That's sort of the ADA, you know, Mm -hmm. guidelines, they're really vague. So it's a big deal. You know, it really is. I mean, as we all know, if, 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 you know, you can't, there's all these adages, like you can't out eat or you can't out train a bad diet and all those things are true, right? Mm -hmm. They really are. So we definitely address nutrition. Now we have an app and it pulls in my fitness pal, which is a really, if people that don't know they're listening, that's a very common way to track food. And I I think just being aware is, is the most important thing. And believe me in 30 years with the dietitian on our staff, we've tried everything and we've tried like groups, like almost like a weight watchers type of setup. We've done personal nutrition coaching. And quite honestly, the most effective thing that we've done is just set up some really good guardrails, like, like eating more protein, you know, there's no magic in protein. It's not going to magically turn into muscles, but it does fill you up. So Mm -hmm. if you have a certain requirement of protein to get every night, you know, if you have a dinner that has some protein in it, It's probably going to give you, you know, increase your satiety. So you're not going to overeat later. So there's like some simple strategies that we implement, but yeah, it's a hundred percent a big deal. And we find that, you know, we try to do one habit at a time. So we start with the exercise because that's kind of why people came in. And if you try to flip it too quick, as you know, Quinn, if somebody comes in, they're like, I need to start working out and you go, that's not your biggest problem. You really need to change your eating habits. You might lose them, right? You just need to meet them where they are and be like, okay, fine. And then a month later, you know, we use tools like the in body, which measures body composition, things like that. You know, you get down the road a month and they've lost a little bit of body fat, but the lean tissues up, which is a good thing. Cause you know, that kind of helps the metabolism and it helps with the weight loss long-term. Then you can have that conversation because they've already built that habit of exercise and they've liked you and they're showing up two, three days a week. Now you can stack the next habit on, which is like, Hey, let's have you track food for a week. And, the, and we can do it through our app. Right. And then they're like, Oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> it's not, I think, as you know, it's not lost on people that like, you know, sitting down at nine o'clock at night and eating a, a pint of haagen ice cream, that's not good for your weight loss, right? Mm-hmm. So the most important thing is there's someone else in your life who is expecting you to do better than that. And that's really the key. It's just the accountability. They know if I got to come see Quinn on Friday and it's my day that I'm going to get my body composition checked again, I better do the things I need to do. So it goes back to that relationship that you talked about, right? I think that's key. But yeah, man. Nutrition's a thousand percent uh, the most important thing, especially when it comes to the main goal that people are looking for these days, which is weight loss. Gotcha. And, and how do you personally feel about like the the specific types of diets, like the vegan or people that do or vegetarian? Like, how do you personally feel about those diets? Because I, I tend to see that whatever is hot or is trending during that time, that's what everybody <laughs> jumps on. Like, you know, like two, three years ago when everybody uh, started booming free, it came out of nowhere. And now, Everybody's saying they're gluten free. So, how do you personally feel about those trends? And what would you like everybody's people? gluten intolerant now. All of a sudden, I'm like, are you right? Because like, you were fine a few years ago when you eat the bagel. It's like, no, no, I mess up my stomach. You know, I'm like, all right. But I think elimination diets make things easy, right? And I think like as long as I've been in the industry, I can tell you like things kind of come and go. It'll be like you know, it'll be like high carb, low fat. It's a big deal, but it was like you know, uh, high protein, low carb. You know, Atkins ish, and then it was the zone, and then it was you know, paleo, and then it was, you know, caveman, and they kind of just the same thing, reskinned every few years, it seems like, right? So uh, here's what I will say, anything that you do, whether it's vegan or carnivore diet, or any of those things that are popular right now, they're all going to be better than the typical American diet. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating just complete crap, and not paying any attention, and you go to a vegan diet, is it going to see an improvement in your health? 
100%, right? So I don't think there's any one diet that works perfectly for everyone forever, but I think any, any and all of those things will work. Now, we, uh, we talked a little bit before about the importance of just protein in general. Again, not because it's magic, but I just like it because it just makes people feel full. So they tend to overeat less. And that's really the, the key is portion control, things of that nature. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say that if you're on something like a strict vegan diet, really do your homework. Because as you've probably seen, Quinn, mm-hmm. sometimes you go from like, you know, I'm going to get healthy. So obviously I'm going to eat vegan, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but what it manifests itself as is just eat a bunch of junk food all day because, you know, you can eat Doritos and, you know, little snack foods and everything. And all that stuff is like vegan supposedly, mm-hmm. but it's not necessarily healthy. So it's, it's sometimes hard to do some of these diets well. Mm-hmm. So I would just say like, you know, if it works for you, great, but you don't have to jump on every bandwagon and every trend, just try to keep things in moderation, which is hard, but that's mm-hmm. the way to do it. Got you. And, and what was something that you would recommend? Because I was listening to some of your other podcasts. I know that you train some celebrities. Um, what is what is something that you recommend for people that are just starting out to how to balance out their personal life and trying to get a workout in as well? Because I know that's something that I've seen with a lot of clients that when they first come to me, that's one. That's the number one thing that they're having trouble with is getting a fit schedule and balancing out everything within their life. So what is something that you would recommend? I mean, obviously this would be biased towards what you and I do, but I would say hire a trainer because nothing better than making an appointment. And, you know, you have to set aside that time. It's like making a phone call appointment, making this podcast appointment, whatever it is, you know, once you put that on your calendar and somebody's waiting for you, it's really important, right? That, that, that's going to go a long way towards making you show up and actually do the workout. I would say that, you know, as much as you and I would talk about science and all the cool things we do for people and moving better, at the end of the day, the most important thing that we may be doing for people is just making an appointment and holding them accountable. And, you know, things that personal training is great for that, right? Like when you look at fitness, that's just class-based, where it's like 30 people in a class and like you show up or not, and you know, whatever, right? It's like you're another warm body out of 30. You do mm-hmm. personal training, you don't show up. There's somebody waiting for you and they're, they're going to notice if you don't show up, right? And there's also, you know, the carrot and the stick. So the carrot would be, okay, long-term health. But the stick is, well, if you don't show up, you're going to get charged for the session. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a, a thing that seems negative, but I think it's a real positive because like whatever I can do to get you to the gym, I'm going to do it. And if it takes a big stick, you know, as opposed to the carrot, so be it. Mm-hmm. At least you showed up, right? And you worked out. So I would say making time is really just about making that appointment because that's like forced carve out of your time to get it done. So, I mean, I know it sounds self-serving for you and I, but I would say hire a coach, hire a trainer. That's, that's what they're going to give you. No, that's awesome. Um, and the one thing I want to ask you as well, I know a lot of women they struggle with is uh, losing weight. Um, and I know you, you've seen it when you, I'm sure when you first started training, everybody would go into the gym. I know I've seen it personally and they would kill themselves on the treadmill and they would do all these things. And t- typically that would just run them into a wall because after that, it's like they would lose the motivation because I don't know. I don't know what it is about that. It's just a lot of women, they go hit the stairs or they hit the treadmill and it's just nonstop. And then they just run into that wall um, and they're not seeing the results that they want. So what is something or that you would recommend to help women really like lose the weight that they're after? Yeah, I would say, and this is counterintuitive to maybe what the, the message has been in the past, mm-hmm. which is cardio, you know, because it burns calories. Right. So I would say you start with strength, honestly. Because if you can get stronger and you can put a little bit of lean tissue on and keep in mind the hormone profile of most females is not going to allow them to get these massive muscles anyway, right? So all it's going to do is add lean tissue without increasing size, which is good. And that's going to help you burn more calories. And and one thing you have to be careful of if you do a lot of cardio is it's going to drive your hunger really high because most people do cardio. They're not going like all out because you can't do that for very long. And they're not going low enough to be in sort of the fat burning zone. If you're going to look at like zones as a, as a, you know, a percentage of say VO two max or something. So they kind of hang out in this no man's land where they're burning a little bit of sugar or whatever. And then that just can make your appetite jump off like crazy. Right. Mm. So you're getting on a, say a machine at the gym an elliptical and it's drastically overestimating how many calories that you're burning and Mm. it's making you hungry and it's giving you no sort of afterburn effect. There's no metabolic boost from a, uh, you know, a, kind of difficult cardio workout, Mm -hmm. but that's kind of been the stigma for all this time is because women don't want to get big, right? Which I know you and I would laugh at that, but it's still (laughs) out there and they're afraid of doing strength training. But here's what I would say to to anybody who's listening, who worries about that, go into any gym 
And even if you're female, just look onto the cardio equipment and look at the body shapes and the fitness of the people on the cardio equipment, and then look out onto the strength training floor. Mm -hmm. And if you just want to just look at females to do a, a direct comparison, do that. And tell me where the fitter, if you will, or the people that seemingly are more fit based on the way they look, where are they? Are they on the cardio machines or are they in the strength, on the strength training floor? And you, you know the answer to this rhetorical question. They're on the strength training floor. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Why would you choose option A if that's where most of the people that you know are not the fittest in the gym, what, and that's what they're doing, as opposed to doing what everyone else is doing, right? No, you're right about that. And like I said, a lot of people, uh, it's been preached in the fitness industry that cardio, cardio, cardio is the answer. But like I said, uh, I don't think a lot of people have a lot of clients' best interests in mind. So when they go into these uh, training sessions, it's just, like I said, I've seen it. A lot of people just going to just do it for the money. And when you do it like that, it's just, that that really gives a sour taste to people as, as yourself, as you've been in the business for over 29 years and you you're very passionate about what you do and you'd rather worry about a client's health than worry about a paycheck. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, by the way, if, if you're only worried about the paycheck, that's going to be short lived, right? Because you can't produce results for people over time. It doesn't take long for the word to get out and you're not going to get any referrals. So it's going to hurt your business anyway. So you're really in it for a short term. If you're just taking that lazy approach, if you really want people to be successful, you got to stand up and tell the truth. And it's not always easy to, talk someone out of a stigma of like, and, you know, okay, we're going to start with strength and then we'll, you know, you're going to get some cardio. Right. So I'll just give you like our prescription for anybody listening. That's interested. It's like, okay, strength first, move around more. If you look at like people that um, just move more, right. Like you're not just sitting all day. Cause there's an actual term. I think it's like active sedentary where all you do is work out at the gym and you just sit on your ass for like all the rest of the hours of the day. The little old lady that lives down the street from me that's gardening all day is crushing your calorie count if you're that person. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't work out. I'm just saying you should try to add some just daily movement into your life. Mm -hmm. You know, look at these blue zones all over the world where it's like people that live to be 100 or older. They're all just based on people just moving at low levels all day long. They walk everywhere. They garden. They just move, right? I think in our society, it's you know, convenience, cars, everything else. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we have forced ourselves to move around a little bit more. So strength first move more. So just walk, you know, try to walk 30 minutes a day, you know, start there. And then, you know, once or twice a week, get your heart rate really high. And you can do that after your weight training session. You could do like what we call metabolic finisher for four to six minutes, or you could do something on the weekends, like play a sport or something that gets your heart really high. That's it. Right. So two or three days of weights, move more, get your heart rate up once or twice a week, try to not eat like a jerk. That's basically the formula for lifelong success. <laughs> there it is, simplified. <laughs> yes, sir. I appreciate that. And one more thing I want to touch on, just personal training wise, um, before we move into your alloy uh, franchise company, um, is the topic of mental health because I know a lot of uh, that gets overlooked as well. Um, I just want to ask you, uh, how have you seen it over the twenty nine years? Like, how important is it, um, and why do you think is it being so overlooked in the uh, health and wellness industry? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it's huge. And, you know, there's so many studies that anybody can Google right now that talk about exercise and depression and how some exercise, you know, exercise in some cases is actually better, markedly better than like SSRIs, you know, things like antidepressants, things like that. hundred percent. Right. Now it's harder than taking a pill. We all know that that's, that's a phenomenon, right? It's much easier to take a pill. But if you could do something that would make your body healthier while also helping your mind, that would be key. I mean, listen, it, again, it keeps sound self-serving, but always goes back to hiring a coach. It's like also you know, a great thing about a personal trainer. And we used to have this hanging up front of our desk. It would say, We're, we want to be the best part of your day every day because some people's lives are not well sorted. And they're, you know, they got family members that are sick or, you know, some things are their own choices. Some things are not. And they're just in a bad way. And you look at like what's COVID's done to people being stuck at home and mental health issues. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, exercise can really help. And literally, and not even like, you know, in a, in a frou-frou way, but literally chemically can be measured what it does to the mind. So I think it's key. I think um, things like, you know, you see the stigma for even like therapy, like if you're going to be your best self, right? Nothing wrong with going and talking to somebody about what you're working through. You'll probably find out if anything that you're having similar challenges to everybody else. And sometimes that alone will make you feel better. Like you're not crazy. Right. So I think it's key. And I think exercise really, really helps. 
And then I think if that's not enough, sure, go to the doctor, you know, talk to someone that's a professional, take your medications if you need to. But I think a lot of it could be solved with just exercise, honestly. No, that's awesome. So I just want to transition and um, I want to ask you yourself. I know a lot of people, especially they, they started to get the PPP loans and everything. So a lot of people have extra cash. So everybody wants to start a gym or own a gym. What does it actually take to own a gym? Yeah, a million dollar question, right? So <laughs> I would say the first thing is money. And uh, the biggest challenge that we've seen is, over the all the years is that people come in underfunded, right? Mm-hmm. And they'll say something like, well, I'm just going to cobble this small gym together. I'm going to put it in the back of this warehouse district, you know, um, I got a couple of clients already that I'm going to bring with me and then I'm just going to work on referrals. and I'm going to go from there. And sometimes you leave a company that you're working with who's giving you leads or whatnot. And then you go and, and there's a great book, by the way, for any of your listeners about business called the E-Myth Revisited. Mm-hmm. So E is in like an entrepreneur, but the E-Myth Revisited. And in that book, he talks about there's different types of characters. And one of them is the technician, right? The technician would be like to you and I, that real technical trainer or that trainer who's working inside of somebody else's business. Mm-hmm. And then they get the, uh, he calls it an entrepreneurial seizure where you're like, I want to get my own business. It's <laughs> like, well, as you know, once you become a business owner, it's a whole different ball game. Like mm-hmm. you're no longer the, just a personal trainer. You are first and foremost, a business owner. And this new business has to be cared for like a separate entity, like it's a relationship, almost like a girlfriend or a wife or a boyfriend or whatever that is. Mm. You got to take care of that thing. And that means you got to learn marketing and budgets and, you know, accounting and all the things that you never had to do when you were just going into this gym, you know, just training folks thinking like I could do this on my own. (laughs) So part of that and what we see the biggest shortcoming is that people just go in underfunded. Now, Mm. One thing about franchising that we've learned um, is that, you know, there are financial requirements and we do that not necessarily for us. Yeah, we want to make sure that they can get, you know, down the runway and get open, but it's also to protect the individuals, right? Because we've seen it so many times people come in underfunded, you know, they get down the road six or eight months. And if they just could have made it to month nine, they would have started to break even and go, but they ran out of runway and they went out of business, right? And the statistics are scary when you get into business for yourself. You know, it's some very small percentage make it to five years. Wow. And part of it is, is this. There's no plan. It's not a business plan. You just like, you know, this whole entrepreneurial like <laughs> uh, love story that they tell on Instagram where it's like burn the ships, go all in, throw it all out there. You know, just no looking back. Everything I've got. I'm like, Ugh, that's not a great idea. Like, that's not really how to do a business. Right. Mm-hmm. So I would say it takes, first of all. You got to have the right lens on things. You got to be willing to upskill yourself. Because again, if you're going from technician, which is like trainer to business owner, there's some skills that you're going to have to acquire. So you got to be willing to do that. You got to be willing to, to secure some money, even if it's through a, like an SBA loan or, a, you know, a, someone's backing you, something like that. Those are all great options. Mm-hmm. Um, upskill yourself. And then once you can do those things and, and, you're, and you're in that mindset, I think you're going to be all right. Because of Eventually, if you can last long enough, you'll figure things out if you're not too thick headed to if you're smart enough to say, I don't know everything and I'm going to have to go and get some help and some coaching or take some classes or whatever that is. You'll Mm -hmm. be just fine. Gotcha. And what are some things that you look for? So say if I came to you and I said, um, I I want you to franchise my gym and I and I was just in a rough patch. What are some things that you look for as a as a franchise owner and say, if you have this, I'll, I'll go with you. But if not, then I'll just part my ways and you'll be on your own. Yeah, for sure. So first of all, it's money, just so that we know. So we do, there's there's a couple thresholds for money. So it's like, you have to have 300000 in net worth. That would be like, okay, what's the equity in homes, cars, investments, everything total. And then you you subtract your liabilities and then you got to have a plus 300K. Mm-hmm. And then about a third of that has to be liquid, means you can get to it. So it's not locked up in something like a long-term retirement account or something that you can't get to, right? Mm-hmm. So those are the first requirements. And it always sounds, people are always put off when they talk to somebody if they don't understand franchising or they're not coming from like the investor side. Mm-hmm. They're just like going to run their own gym and they're like, Hey, I want to hear about your franchise. I'm like, oh, great. How much money do you have? It seems really off-putting, right? But it's like, okay, that if we, if we don't have that, there's like no point in yeah. talking because <laughs> you're probably not going to make it. So mm-hmm. um, there's that. And then also they have to be the right character. So we've had people that were interested in doing franchises. You know, one guy was, um, you know, from the Northeast, he came down and spent a day with us. And man, he had 
He wants to do three or four states, like the whole state, right? Oh. Tons and tons of money. But it turns out he's just not a very nice guy. Like we wow. go out to lunch and he's kind of rude to the server and he just throws his weight around, his money around. It's like, ooh. I mean, a franchise for sure is kind of like a partnership. It's like mm-hmm. I'm using your money to to grow faster than I could on my own. That's for kind of what franchising is, right? Um, so you got to make sure we, we're going to be in a 10 year relationship at least. So it's like, well, you got to make sure that they're the right people. So first of all, are they funded? And then two, do they fit your culture? Cause you got to work with these folks, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, granted you might be in, you know, Texas and we're in Atlanta and we find you, know, we do the real estate and do all the things for you to, to get it all dialed in. But if we have to work together for long term and it's not a good fit, that'll make it tough. So really I'd say money first. And then are you good culture fit is most important. And I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people listen to the podcast. They don't even realize how important the people skill and just having, and even if you have a lot of money, just being still being sociable and be relatable to people that don't have money, because that's one of the things my mentor always told me, no matter how much money you make, you never feel like you're too good for anybody because you never know how you may you may help them or they may help you later in life. So I'm glad that you brought that up as well. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. And I mean, what we see is like you know, some of the people that are the most successful, most, most successful are some of the nicest people. It's like because you, you find out like. Once you do acquire some funds and some money, you start to figure out like beyond a certain threshold, there's, it's not going to make you any happier. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's not even that important. And when you get to that stage, you're like, well, there, I, if you if you were you know driving the car you wanted. And I mean, listen, there's the whole the other conversation about being too materialistic and all that stuff. But I mean, if you have the things you want, you can support yourself, you can support your family, you're, you're living in the place that you want all the Beyond that, it's not a whole lot. I mean, what can you do, right? Like I got a buddy who's uber successful um, in the health and fitness space. um, And he's done videos on this. Like, hey, I've lived like an Instagram influencer, right? Um, Private jets and Bentleys and all these things. And he can afford it like tenfold. But he's like, it's not worth it. You know, things like, well, I bought a Bentley, but like I hated it because like they don't have enough product in market to do a lot of testing. So you hook your phone up, doesn't even work. Mm-hmm. I hook all these knobs. It's always in for maintenance. And I, I rent a Chevrolet when I'm on vacation and everything just works because they got a ton of product testing. And he talks about, you know, getting a $500 steak as opposed to like going to Applebee's. He's like, I hate to admit it, but except for the name on the door. Applebee's food is better because they do a ton of product testing because they're all over the place and they're really good, you know? And so it's like funny to hear someone who can do whatever they want, say like, none of these things are even worth it. You know, Mm -hmm. fancy clothes. It's like, all right, I mean, it's cool. But like, I'm, he's like, I'm wearing a shirt that my aunt got me for Christmas. It's like a t-shirt. It's like, (laughs) it just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so I think to your point, like being a nice person, um, and, and sometimes the folks with money have it figured out if they're new to it, maybe not. But usually it's the folks that are climbing the ladder that are most affected and impressed by it. It's the ones that already have it or like, it's not all that it's cracked up to be anyway. It's not going to make you any happier, you know? Mm, I definitely understand. And then I want to ask you as well, what, what makes your company different from the other franchises out there? Like what has made you guys more successful than others? I'm sure there's other people that run franchises, but you being the, the top in the country, how, how have you made it to that level? I think, um, First of all, we got to franchising with a lot of experience. So a lot of times it's like, you know, I've got one gym. This is how it might go down. Like, say I'm a hamburger shop. I've got one hamburger shop here in Atlanta, and there's a line out the door every day. So I'm like, my hamburger shop kills it. I'm going to start franchising. But I really only have like one place. So it could be location. It could be a lot of things, right, that are making it successful. So we came to franchising by working in worldwide markets with tons of different fitness brands. And we could kind of start to see where there was gaps in the market, just from Mm -hmm. all the evidence that we had coming back. And it's like, all right, well, here's a gap that we can fill that we're really good at. And that gap turns out to be like our customer avatar is different than most fitness brands. So if you look at most, especially boutique fitness, if you look at like an Orange Theory or an F45 or some of these guys, they're all targeting typically female leaning younger people like 30 years old, right? That are already fit. That's who you see in their ads. That's who they're going after. And that's all fine and dandy. But like, I'll take, you know, the average, I think the average stay in a brand that does classes like that, it's like five months, right? So that a customer is only going to stay for five months. Mm-hmm. And the national price point average for that is like $129 a month. Mm-hmm. If you do the math on that, that's, you know, that's a lifetime value of how long they stay and how much they pay formula. It's like 650 bucks. It's like, okay, well, that's not bad. 
But someone like you and I, Quinn, if, if we get a customer, they're going to pay three or $400 a month for personal training. And our average stay is three years, mm-hmm. right? So if you do that math, that's like $10,000 in lifetime value. And by the way, to acquire those two customers, it's like the same cost. Mm-hmm. So like, which one do you want? The one who stays five months and pays a little less or the one who stays mm-hmm. you know, three years and pays more? Well, that ends up driving our average customer a bit older. So we're really targeting 45 to 65 with money because that's who can afford personal training. Mm -hmm. So that's different than like most fitness brands that are going after 30 year old fit females, right? Uh, That are more like cardio based classes or something like that. So that's another thing that sets us apart. So tons of experience. And then we really go after an underserved, if you will, gap in the fitness market. Got you, got you. And then with COVID hit uh, last year or the year before, how did that really affect the the fitness industry? Because I know a lot of gyms are shutting down, a lot of gym dating because everybody couldn't go to the gym. So how did you guys maintain or bounce back from that um, successfully? Yeah, so we were lucky. First of all, we were in we're in Georgia, and so Georgia was one of the first states to reopen for fitness. So we were really lucky to be in Georgia. So our corporate gyms that are here in Georgia were did just fine. Now, while we were closed, we were closed for six to eight weeks. Um, while we were closed, because we do personal training, and our crowd that we service is smaller. So our gym's small footprint. We've got like 130, 150 customers in each gym. That's not a lot of people. That's not like a big gym that's got 10,000 customers, right? Mm -hmm. We know everybody by name. We know their kids' names. We know their goals. You know, they know us. They know our kids' names. It's like, that's the kind of environment similar to what you're working in in personal training. Well, that type of intimacy in a relationship creates more trust. Mm -hmm. So I know that like us knowing each other and being good friends doesn't mean that we can't spread a virus, but it just helped the business because overall people felt more comfortable because they felt like they knew the people they were working out with and they knew the owner and he was cleaning things well and doing everything he needed to do to keep it clean. Mm -hmm. So our brand did well because of that. And then we also have an app. So we were able that drives exercises. It pulls in my fitness pal. It connects to wearables. So we were able to then, instead of just streaming zoom classes, we were able to approach each individual like yourself and be like, okay, Quinn, what kind of equipment do you have at home? It's like, all right, this, well, I know that you got a bad back and you want you know, weight loss goal, blah, 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 blah. So I have all that. So I can design a, and push a workout to you that's specific to you. So we kept doing personal training. We just serviced it through the app virtually as opposed to just streaming like classes that everyone would do. And that was fine as a placeholder, but that's not, you know, that's not something you could charge as much for, right? For a lot of these brands. So I'd say those two things really helped us. Now, the industry overall, yeah, man, it took a beating. Like it was hard to sell franchises to investors because a lot of states weren't even allowed fitness to be open. Mm. So it's like, if you're, if you're just a guy who's working a corporate job and you're like, Hey, I want to invest in a franchise and you don't have any, you know, sort of bias towards what you want to do. It's like, if you looked at fitness, you're like, I'm not doing that right now. That's not even allowed to be open in California Mm. or New York or something. Right. But like HVAC or like home improvement things were like blowing up. So a lot of people were moving away from like fitness related things and going to other types of franchises. Mm -hmm. But quite honestly, as soon as the veil lifted from COVID, like everybody was back on it. So brick and mortars, we did fine franchise sales, eh, took a beating, but we're back on it. Yeah. that's awesome like i said I, that's very it tells a, a lot about you that you were able just to adapt doing that just even through the app because a lot of people don't even think that far ahead but that just shows you're planning ahead and how you're able just to move and a lot of people they when they hit with things they're not able to adjust they they basically go down and they can't get back up so that says a lot about you um as i appreciate that yes sir. thank you i appreciate that and a lot of it i mean listen it's like kind of like you know, again that question like, hey, did you plan this whole thing? I'm like, no, it just happened. <laughs> it's like, same thing here. Like we already had this app and we would use it. Like if you had a client, Quinn, that was like, hey, I'm going to be going to my second home in Florida for a month. It's like, well, you don't want them to quit working out. So for their sake, you want to give them something to do. And then also for your sake and their sake, you want to keep earning revenue, right? You don't want them to quit paying you. So it's like, all right, well, listen, I'm not going to let you quit. So tell me what you have in your condominium gym in Florida and I'm going to design a workout for you. And then you're going to check off that you did it. And I'm going to hold you accountable. So it was a way for you to stay in their life as a coach. That's what we were using it for. It's just a placeholder, but lo and behold, COVID hits. And it's like, ah, oh, we got the perfect tool, right? Not planning for it to be used in that way. But again, I could say it was luck or whatever, but we, we were just sitting right on it. So I think it just speaks to having a culture where 
you know, as a business or as an individual that you're flexible, right? You can sort of take a step back and see all the moving parts and be like, all right, well, there's some things already in place that we can use. We'll just pivot to this for a minute. And that's, that's basically survival in business. Got you. And, and one, one last question I have for you before I let you go. I know that you're, like I said, you're CEO. Um, how do you balance out personally everything that goes on in your life? Because I know there may be times when you're a family and something comes up in the business, you may have to take care of that. Um, and somebody that's looking to get into being a CEO one day, they're not, they may not be able to understand how important putting a business over family or friends or even just building up to that point. So is there any advice that you would give to them if, if they wanted to first start out or trying to become a CEO one day? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, there's a couple things that need to happen. Like you need to, you need to better skills, right? So if you look at this, if there was two scales sitting next to each other and one of them was your skill level and the other one was the opportunity vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. So like when you start out, you might just be working in someone else's gym, earning a small percentage or something as a personal trainer. And that may be where your skill set is, right? And so it matches the opportunity vehicle. Well, if you want to move up to like, say you want to be the manager of that facility, well, you got you to level up your skills. And typically your skills have to go before, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say, make sure that you're constantly learning and moving towards the things that you want to do. You're not just going to get it because you've been hanging around for a long time. You've got to have skills that are applicable to that job. So if you've got opportunities over here, one through 10, and skills over here, one through 10, if you're at a two, you, you only deserve to be in a two opportunity vehicle, right? If you want to be in a five, you got to upskill first and then you can do it, right? It's kind of like learning to be a business owner thing. And then you're just going to have to plan at times. And you understand this as, as a young man who's in business. It's like, there's going to be times when you're going to have to surge, right? And that means you're going to have to spend more time working than you are on other parts of your life. That's, mm -hmm. that's a fact, you know? I think, I think some of that whole, you know, grind and work you know, a million hours a day, like a Gary V kind of, you know, advice, like some of that gets overplayed. You don't have to do that. You really don't, but there are going to be times in your life where you have to suck it up and there's not going to be as much balance as you want, mm -hmm. right? You're going to have to put more into the business and that's going to come at the expense of like wife and kids and, and other things. And part of that's like, pick your partner, right? Too, right? Because if you've got a spouse, that's like, why are you working so much? And you're trying to build this dream. It's like, that's going to be really hard, right? So they're either in the trenches with you or they're supporting you or they're against you. And you're going to want that person. Like if you're out there, you know, building the business and your wife's home, keeping the books, or she's out building the business and you're keeping the books and staying with the kids, however that works, that's great. You know, you're in it together or she or he's home, just being your biggest cheerleader and just saying, take that time, go for it, babe. I know you're building something for our family. You go do it. Right. Those two scenarios work. But if you got that person at home, who's like, you know, like on your case, they know what they got into. Like, what do you, what are we doing? Like, yeah. do you want to eat or not? <laughs> it's like, I sound pretty harsh, but you, you get it. Right. No. So I would say that there's times when you're not going to be balanced and make sure that the other people in your life understand that. And then eventually when you get further down the road, and then we're talking about skills and opportunities, right. Like you're able to hire people to do things. And so the point with me now, like I'm not that busy. People are like, you must be so busy. You know, running all these things. I'm like, I mean, it's always on my mind, but like I've got people around me that are way smarter than me and way better at what they do. So it's not like I got to be the best at marketing or the best at, you know, accounting or finance. I've got people that I've been able to hire that are 50 times smarter than me in those areas. So eventually what a CEO does is you have tough conversations with people if you need to. You drive culture, you, you're a servant leader, so you give people support where they need it, right? If you're always the smartest guy in the room, you've not done a good job hiring, right? So you've got to be able to say like, you've got to be able to accept that because at some point when you're a solopreneur or whatever, like you're everything. Mm -hmm. But eventually as you grow, you're going to have to hire people and not be the smartest person. And you have to let that go. Like, just let them have it. Put some guardrails up. You know, they got a budget. There's, there's some goals. Go get after it, you know? And so I think eventually as you work your way through that little tight spot, Probably in the, between those ages of like 25 and 40 or something like that, you're going to have some tight spots. But then once you, if you keep moving forward, you'll be able to give yourself some more breathing room. Now, now were you able, or what I should say is, do, did it affect your personal relationships with friends or per se, when everybody would be going out and you had to work on the business? Did you ever have or run into times where as you're climbing your way up to the top, you've had to sacrifice certain friendships and be like, I can't. I can't associate with you anymore because I know a lot of people when you hear <laughs> I, even my mentor, he would he would tell me during those times where his his process of getting to the top is like, yeah, I, I, you can't bring certain people with you. And me, I'm starting to realize that now being 25 is like 
I don't I don't associate with the people that I hang out where I used to hang out with because they're not in the same mindset that I have. So would you would you think that that is correct? 100 percent, man. And that is a great point and a really good question. And, you know, I opened my gym when I was 22. So you and I were a similar age. So by the time I was 25, I had kids already and I had a mortgage. It was like, all right. I mean, I got there quick, mm-hmm. but I can remember hiring people like in their 50s to work for me. And I was 22. And I was like, tell me about your life experience. They're probably like, God, who is this kid? You know, but I mean, it was my business at the end mm-hmm. of the day. But what I found is, you know, when you're in college and all, you got like your party friends. I mean, we all do, right? You got mm-hmm. your wild, crazy friends and go out. And that's all fun and games. But like, once you get your hustle going, it, you can't go out on a Thursday night and throw down and get up Friday morning and be, be in it. You just can't. And so there are people who stay in that mode for a longer amount of time. And if you're working for some company down the street that you don't care about, you can go out and get hammered and maybe, you know, make it into work and do half, half baked work all day. And maybe not even notices, but when you're in the game on your own, you got to be on it. Right. And so no doubt about it, that when I was 22 and I had plenty of party friends and wild and crazy, and I opened my gym, I had to completely change my lifestyle. I had to be up at 430 every morning, you know, because I was in here training people too. And then I'd be working till nine o'clock at night. So I was still able to keep somewhat of a social life, but I found that it really revolved around people that kind of understood what I was doing. Maybe they had a similar lifestyle to me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, I can remember, um, I can remember after I had my first kid and then we were getting ready to have our second kid. And I remember saying like, I'm never going to have a minivan. Never. I'm never going to, I'm going to drive a pimped out SUV. I'm going to put rims on it. Like I'm from Atlanta. So it's like, that's what we do. And I'm like, that's what I'm driving. Right. And then, and of course you get in the van. I'm like, damn, this thing's nice. Got cup holders everywhere. You know, seats popping in and out. I was like, we got to get one of these. So I get this minivan and I'm driving home from work. And I only live a couple miles from the from my gym at the time. And I stop at a stoplight. You know how you feel somebody pull up next to you? You can just feel them looking at you. Yeah. I'm like, so you don't want to look. So you're like, what's this guy? Somebody going to like want to fight? I mean, it's just the way we are. You know, so I'm yeah. like, so I look over and it's a dude that I haven't seen in like a year and a half, two years. And it's one of those friends. That I, all I did was party with him. Mm-hmm. Right. So I completely lost touch because we don't have anything in common. He's still doing it, by the way. He's still <laughs> clubbing every night. Right. <laughs> I am not. Yeah. And so I'm out here building something and he's out here clubbing. And so he looks at me and I roll the window down and I haven't seen the guy in years. And we were really tight friends at one point. And the first thing he says is like, nice van. And of course I'm like, Hey, F you, you know, whatever, dude. I you van. He's like, yeah, good. So he's still where I was at, at 22. And I have to say it kind of felt good. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, I mean, I've made in my mind anyway, I had made some progress. So yeah, unfortunately. And, and honestly, dude, every step along the way, like when we went from one gym to two, gyms or two gyms to licensing, licensing to franchising. We, we have at times left people behind in every one of those steps and it's painful. It really is. Cause sometimes you try and drag them along, but sometimes they just can't do it. You know I mean? They're perfectly suited and you know, they've been with you for a while and they've been Mm -hmm. an important part of that current business and you move over here and it takes a different skill set, Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they reach the level of their competency and then that's it. And so You get everything from like jealousy of where you are. Why aren't you back hanging out with me anymore in the gym every day? It's like, well, I got another gym to run and then we're starting this other business. And so we've had that all different facets. And I think it's just part of the process of growth. And if someone's toxic and working against you, you got to leave them behind. And sometimes even if you like them, you got to leave them behind anyway. You know, it's painful, but it's just part of the process. And it's a price you pay to be an entrepreneur. It's, It's not for wimps. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I appreciate you even coming on the show and just sharing that advice because a lot of people, they don't, if they're not in the same circle as somebody that's successful, they would never hear that information. And I know for me, like right now, I, it's something I, I I used to struggle with, but now it's because I have mentors and somebody like yourself, where we were just affirming what I told you. It's like, I just know I'm on the right path and doing the right thing. So I appreciate it. hundred percent, man. Cool. Just keep going. That's it. I mean, there's a really good author. His name's Simon Sinek. And he always talks about, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Since I know you probably want to wrap up, but you're like, Hey man, I don't want to take too much of your time. Two hours later, you're like, I gotta, I gotta go dude. This, talk, this guy talks about stuff. But um, there's a guy named Simon Sinek and he's wrote a book and it's called infinite games. And what he talks about, is like big business and how, like, if you're a public company, you know, you're trying to like appease your shareholders every quarter. Like you got to show profits all the time, right? Your stocks are up and down as a result of it. So you make these really short term decisions and how wrong that is. And really, the idea should be to just keep going. And an infinite game means that the goal is just to stay in business and keep growing and keep going. And I think that's something that everybody should hear. Now, within that, 
there are finite scores, right? It's sort of like, all right, well, you got to make profit and you got to be able to pay folks and you got to grow, you know, you got to have a marketing budget. And there's things that you have to measure in your business, Mm -hmm. but it's not always about winning or beating the competitors as much as it is about getting up and doing good in the world every day, something that you enjoy and just keep going. And every stage is going to be different. Like right now you're hitting your stride, right? You're having to leave some folks behind that maybe aren't in that same sphere with you or the Mm -hmm. same headspace. And it's painful, but you learn. And then you're like, all right, good, check, you know, next step, mm-hmm. next step. And the goal is just, just keep going. And if you do that and you learn and you're open and you're already doing seeking mentors and all that, and anybody listening, um, I hope this helps. It's like, that's the key, man. If you just keep going in 30 years, you might end up like me. I didn't plan any of it, right? You might end up still able to wear sweatpants to work every day. And by the way, now you got a worldwide enterprise thing going and you're the dumbest guy in your company. Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome, my man. And then before I let you go, I just want to know what what's a typical day life day in the life of um of you. So what what do you do from beginning to end? Yeah, so I I think like I can wake up whenever I want. So I usually get up around six six thirty just as a, out of habit. You know, I go to bed pretty early. I'm probably bed by ten ten thirty. So I'm wake up six six thirty. Um, get up, get some coffee. I usually, uh, you know, I try to do a little bit. I'm not a big morning routine guy, you know, all this like journaling and you know, mantras and all that. It's like, shit, man, I'll just grab some coffee and start working. Like some of that stuff I think is just like a, a you know, it's like you spend so much time building your morning routine. You don't do anything, but that it's like, <laughs> yeah. I think it's, a, it's almost like a distraction, right? Like, okay, uh-huh. you don't want to do work. I get it. You've done like two hours of yoga. You <laughs> journaled for an hour. Like it's noon. You haven't done any work yet. So I get up, grab a cup of coffee, maybe read something inspirational or whatever, keep it short and sweet. And then I just start working. And then uh, usually about noon, I will uh, take a break and, uh, you know, I'll go grab a workout. I still work out a ton. I'm probably in better shape now that I've been in a long time. So that's awesome. Um, I'll still work out a bunch. And then I'm usually home, you know, I'm pretty close to the gym so I can work from home or, or the gym. And I'm usually home by four or five o'clock, mm-hmm. um, wrap up and just hang out with the family. I mean, I got a pretty chill, pretty chill okay. schedule right now. I used to travel like 40 weeks out of the year. Mm-hmm. that was tough, you know, when I was on the plane a lot, but it was a similar schedule. Mm-hmm. So yeah, day in the life of it's different. When I was your age, it was up at four 30 cause I had to be at the gym at six. Wow. And my problems were more like, Hey, you know, what am I going to have for lunch today? Like I didn't cook anything the night before and do food prep. So like, what am I going to eat? You know, I got 30 mm-hmm. minutes between clients. It's like, ah, no food, you know, <laughs> but I think the problems aren't any different. I mean, they're different but they're just different problems, right? It's like you're solving problems when you're there. I'm solving problems now. They're different problems, but they're always going to be there. And that's another good lesson for entrepreneurs is like some problems just can't be fully solved. You just kind of have to learn to sit with them, right? It's like, oh, I got my perfect staff now. And then my favorite guy left. Like, oh, my whole life's coming to an end. I'm like, guess what? I've been in business 30 years. Your favorite guy is going to be that same. You're going to have 10 favorite guys or girls and they're all going to leave at some mm-hmm. point. So like you just learn to kind of like live with certain things because of just the realities of being in business. Not everything's perfect. Not everything can be solved. And once you get there, I think I think you're pretty much set. Man, like I said, I appreciate you really taking the time out your day to talk with me, coming on the show. You, very, you gave very um, a lot of information that I could take in my personal life. I know a lot of listeners as well. Um, they could take that information. And before I let you go, last thing I want to ask, um, what is something that you're most grateful for? Uh, just the game itself, man. Honestly, like I talked about infinite games, the game is just keep going. So I'm just grateful that there's a game to play and I'm still able to do it and wake up and do what I love every single day. Now, that's awesome. And for people that want to get in contact with you for training purposes, um, would you mind just giving out your contact information? Sure. Just reach out. Um, alloyfranchise.com is the best place to find it. Super simple. So alloyfranchise.com. You can fill out the form there. I'm all over social media. Again, it's Rick Mayo, M-A-Y-O. Reach out anytime there. If you got questions about actual training or business or whatever, I'm happy to help anybody that I can. So you can find me pretty much everywhere. And, and you also have your podcast as well. You mind you could just share it as well. People could tune in. Yeah, it's called the Alloy Personal Training Business Podcast. It's very niche. It's just about the business of personal training. Do some mm-hmm. leadership stuff on there. But if you're in the personal training business, um, you might enjoy it. And there's, I think we got 120 episodes or so out there now. Got you. Now I include that in the link below as well. Like I said, I appreciate you cool. taking time Thank today you. Uh, talk to me as well. Looking forward to uh, connecting with you again. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on, man. It's a great conversation.